Just using some paper, fabric, and some paint, you can completely refurbish vintage finds or even pieces you already have. There are lots of really fun decorative things that you can do just with these three materials. I'll even give you some tips on some really good ideas on where to find inexpensive decoupage papers as well as fabrics and paints. I want to upcycle a current chair that I have that my cat has taken a liking to and could use a little bit of a makeover. And I also found this little end table on the Facebook marketplace for only $25. From thrift shops, secondhand stores, as well as garage sales, you can find some really great pieces. And just with a few ideas and decorative ideas, you can really transform your pieces. Giving old pieces of furniture a really good prep before your decorative finish, really important. There's so many cleaners and oils and all kinds of residue that still remains on the finish. This particular little piece is just an MDF particle board with a veneer finish on it. If there's a really high shine finish, I like to give it a little sanding with a 220 grit before I start with a paint. You could even use a household paint, but I'm going to use the chalk paint as it's super thick and has excellent coverage. There's a ton of household paints that also carry a matte finish paint. So you could easily pick up a small little sample for a very inexpensive cost. Almost all paint supply companies, including the chalk paint, also have the sample sizes. Any pieces with really long legs, I find it really helpful to flip it upside down, so this way I can get into all the little crevices in around the rounded out areas of the legs. And I find it much easier to see. So I'm going to tape off the little keyholes and I'm also going to make little plugs for the hardware holes so this way I don't get the paint gummed up. You could even use a really strong paper towel to do the same method. I want to keep this piece fairly neutral, but I also want to give it more dimension. And there are a few really fun ways of doing that. First thing I always do is put on a nice thin coat and let it dry completely. Then I'll apply a second coat and then let it dry completely. It's really helpful when your base coats are 100% dry and just to be sure that the both coats are completely dry, I would give it a few hours. And if you're working in a cool environment, I would even leave it overnight. I definitely wanted to create texture with the paint, so I'm really just going to brush it on every which way. Doing the two thin coats really helps out so that way you don't get bulks of paint in and around the detail of your piece. Although I do want texture, I don't want the paint to be bulky and drippy looking. This also really helps for when you're opening and closing the drawers, that way the paint won't scratch. Bagging the brushes really helps for the second application to keep your paint nice and moist on your brush. One of my favorite products is the Benjamin Moore's Glaze. This is a clear glaze that allows you to do all kinds of fun decorative finishes. It's actually a water base so you can mix it with any paint. I always mix a small amount, four parts glaze to one part paint and a little goes a long way. I already had a little bit of the country gray tone already pre-mixed from a previous project so I'm going to use this as well. I really love the blue shop towels because they're lint free I can use them for the decorative finishes as well as waxes. I generally put the glaze on straight with the brush, but this time I'm actually going to apply the glaze to the towel, then I'm going to apply it to the project. This way I have a little bit more control on the level and the amount, and when it's completely dry, it will actually look a little different versus the application time that I'm doing as you see now. You can do this method even with water and paint and a similar ratio, but I find the glaze gives it a little bit more of a definition as well as it's a little less runny. The beginning stages are always a little bit messy looking, but as it dries, it starts to really come together. I love to mix up the different tones and this gives it a little bit more of a natural marbled kind of look.
Working in small sections is also really helpful. This way you can just play around with it until you like it. And you can put as many layers of the glaze as you want. Its working time is quite good, but it does dry much quicker than paint. So this is why working in small sections gives you a lot more control. I find a really good effect is using something in contrast, so using a really dark color as well as a really light color. And using that medium tone in between the two, light and dark, as a base. If your piece has a lot of defined areas as well as recessed areas, I'll give you a little tip on getting into that. Foam brushes are my go-to for these types of areas. Because they already have a nice little angle, I'm able to push the paint in nice and equally. I just made a mixture of all the colors, then I can go back and highlight it with some wax. First, I'm gonna seal it with clear wax. Pretty easy, just like a moisturizer and a clean, lint-free cloth. And if you'd like to use decorative waxes, the best time is when the clear wax is still moist and hasn't cured onto the piece. So I'm just gonna add some highlights and I'm also just gonna use some dollar store brushes just to get into those tiny little crevices and cornered areas. If you'd like to use brushes for your wax, really easy, just use soap and water and this will clean off the brushes for reuse. The great part is if you want to use a color, white or black wax, you can always bring it back and knocking it back with the clear wax. This is fantastic so that way if you feel like you've added too much and you just want to bring it back a little bit, the clear wax will act as an eraser. I love working with decoupage paper. There's so many crafty things you can do and so many beautiful designs and different styles to choose from. One of my favorite places to purchase decoupage paper is Zazzle.com. I'll have that in the description box below. And there's also different thicknesses when it comes to different types of decoupage. So there is some that's a little bit thicker and some that are almost like a tissue-like. I picked up this three-piece gallery wall frame brand new at a thrift shop for half off so I thought this would be great just to be able to throw some decoupage papers into this and you can create your own sequence with so many different designs to choose from you can always interchange it depending on what styles you're going with or where you want it in your home this is huge cost effective versus even buying prints and if you decide you don't want them in the frames, you can always use them as a decoupage for another project. The other really nice thing is you can just use it for shapes to rebalance where you're putting your decor, or if you wanna add a certain picture or color scheme. If you are making a gallery wall and you do have a lot of photographs, this is also a great way just to add in a little bit more dimension without it being overly busy and taking away from the photographs on the wall. I really wanted to show in the video by just using a simple pattern and then kind of merging them together. It can look really fabulous and all just by thrifted finds and some decoupage paper.
I've actually already painted and put some new trim on this old chair that I got from a thrift shop a couple of years ago, but my cat has taken a liking to it, so I figured I could spruce it up by just adding some new fabric onto the backrest as well as the seat. But I will have to replace the trim as well. I am not a professional upholsterer by any means, but sometimes with just some physics and a little bit of patience, you'd be surprised how well this could turn out. Using the staple gun can be actually quite forgiving, so if you do happen to make a couple of errors and you need to change things up because the upholstery is starting to overlap or create a crease, the taking the staples out is actually quite easy. I was a little bit challenged with using a circular backrest and I was using a ticking material which is the straight lines, so I definitely wanted everything to be cohesive and in line with each other. And you definitely want to pull the fabric tight, but not too tight where it's overstretched. If the fabric's overstretched, what may happen is it may rip, so you want to be careful with that. So whether it's the back or the seat, what I found super helpful is to actually place the fabric exactly where I wanted it, and then apply a staple in all four sides first, then work your way around. This will also help being able to pull your material nice and evenly, even working on a circular area, or even if there's curves in the seating. So again, this will keep the fabric nice and straight. The other tricky area is where the seating backrest meets the seat. So I had to come up and figure out easy ways to go about this slowly and as e seamlessly as I could. You want to cut the fabric so you still have roughly about half an inch, if possible, once you've made your staples. You'll be able to cover that with the trim. To get a really nice even pull on all your fabric, you'll definitely want to have your staples matched up side by side all the way around, whether it's the backrest or the seat. This will keep the fabric firmly in place and less likely to tear. So just like the backrest, I am putting the seat material piece on and I'm going to use a staple on all four sides first. I found by running my hand across the seat, this way I could have the material nice and smooth but not pulled too tightly. The other thing you want to be careful for is to make sure that the staples are going into the frame and not the previous fabric or the cushion. If you have made a mistake, you can just grab yourself a little pair of pliers and just pull the staple out and then restaple. As I got further to the back, I stopped the staple so this way I could make small little relief cuts around the frame. So the trick is, is to make sure that your relief cuts are super tiny. So this way you're almost kind of cutting the fabric to shape where you're going. This will allow you to pull it and then keep making tiny, tiny cuts so that way you're not leaving any wrinkles or any overlap in your material. The other thing that's helpful too is if you know you've got excess fabric is to cut it off as you keep making more relief cuts. And not to worry, if you are in an area that's a little bit trickier on the physics, if you have made a staple and you feel that the material has overlapped or made a crease, just take the staple out and then re-punch your staple and just keep pulling while you're going. And again, just work in small sections and with a little bit of patience, you'll be surprised how well it will turn out. Now, because I didn't take the original material off, I am just reupholstering on top of it. I kind of wished that my trim was a little bit wider, but I may go back and add a pipe trim just so I can cover the underneath of the trim, which you'll see at the end. And again, I'm just going into the second part of the frame here and just making those relief cuts. Just by a couple of centimeters, you want to make sure the relief cuts are super tiny. At the corners of the front of the chair, I decided to go with a little tiny bit of a fold and I wanted to make it as seamless as I could. So the other really helpful thing is just to make sure that you're pulling a little bit as you're making your relief cuts and then keep basically patting the seat with your fingers and this will help relieve any wrinkles. 
There were a couple of areas where I actually had to staple twice because I ended up stapling into the cushion and not the frame. So if that happens, you can always just go back and remove it with small pliers. So I took the side material, stapled it, and then I actually brought just a tiny fold to the front of the chair before I made the fold. And again, I just kept feathering it and then I pulled down into the front and made sure with my finger to hold the fabric from the side exactly where I wanted it. And again, not to worry, if the fold didn't work out as smooth or it has a little bit of a ripple to it, just take the staple out and re-staple. I think it's the power of the staple gun makes it feel so permanent once you've actually put the staple in, but if you have made a tiny little error or you want to redo it, it's not a problem to take the staple out. Once I make my fold on the other side of the seat, I will go back and I will cut the fabric so it's about half an inch all around the staples before I put my trim on. So for the trim, I always use a hot glue and it's actually a fabric friendly hot glue. So I use the Gorilla and I always make sure that the hot glue gun is on half of the temperature. So this way it's a little bit more fabric friendly. As I mentioned earlier, I wish that I had a little bit thicker of a trim. So my trim's probably about an inch, whereas if I had gotten an inch and a half or a two inch, I would have been able to cover that original pipe underneath just a smidge better. I'm still happy with my results, but just try to measure where your staple would be. And this way, when you go to pick out your trim, you'll probably get a better gauge than I did. I'll probably add another quarter inch to the seat a little bit later on just to fix that. Thank you so much for watching this week's video and I'm really looking forward to seeing you soon. Until then, take care.